Hi, I'm Bob Gimlin. The Tlingit tribe is a group of First Nation people that are one of seven tribes who historically lived in the Pacific Northwest. They had collective knowledge of an animal, which science regards as legendary, that they called Kushtika. Kushtika literally translates to Otter Man. Now, if you're anything like me, you rolled your eyes a little bit and lumped Otter Squatch with Bat Squatch and Sheep Squatch and This Squatch and whatever else allegedly labeled educational TV is peddling these days. But the Tlingit people viewed Kushtika in a very real regard. And labeling Bigfoot as Otter Man actually makes a lot of sense. Europeans in North America have referred to Bigfoot as a man-ape, but the Tlingit word for ape is Kushtika. So Otter Man is a linguistic attempt to describe what an ape is. It needed to be a man-something, and let me show you why otter works well. First off is simply the superficial appearance. It doesn't take too much imagination to merge this, otter, with this, human, to get something like this. The otter has uniformed brown hair with less on the face around the eyes, much like Bigfoot, and perhaps brown is the typical color of Bigfoot in the area. Otter, man, equals Bigfoot. Makes sense to me. Works better than bear, because of the otter's reduced ears, due to their aquatic lifestyle. Preferred habitat is another reason why otters may serve as a likely analog for Bigfoot, be it the Pacific Northwest, the marshlands of America's heartland, or the Everglades. An abundance of water seems to be a requirement for Bigfoot, and this is because otter and Bigfoot have similar food requirements. Physical appearance and environmental requirements aside, there is one all-encompassing factor as to why the First Nation people would associate otters with apes. And that is a behavioral trait that the great apes share with otters and few others. If you're alone on Vancouver Island at night and you hear a rhythmic, staccato clacking of rocks, it can really only be two things. Sasquatch or otter. Otters, like primates, have opposable thumbs. They can hold things. They pry open clams. They can manipulate objects they find into tools, much like primates do. So yet again, we see a remarkable consistency in the observations of First Nation peoples that to me makes far too much sense to be random. They named something that has hands and grasps and manipulates objects after the only two other animals they could have known that have hands, otters and men, otter men. This is compelling and remarkable and really shouldn't be ignored. But of course it is. And yes, if you look up Kushtika, you will find folkloric depictions of an unlikely being. But is that what the tinglet said? Or is that how the white men interpreted it? It's hard to say. There is precedent for indigenous people to name animals after other animals with similar behaviors, like stone use, and not simply physical appearance. The Laotian version of the Orang Pendek is called by the indigenous people Kitrao, or Buffalo Man. Not because it looked like a buffalo, but because of the way it noisily crashes through underbrush. Much like how Kushtika is called Otter Man because of a shared behavior. Even Westerners named the bull shark after its bull-like aggression. So what I'm saying is that Otter Man makes sense. From a cultural, linguistic labeling standpoint. Cultural probability is not the only reason that no one should be shocked that the Tlingit we're seeing a great ape. The Tlingit's historic range is surprisingly similar to a known elusive great ape's habitat that wasn't verified until 1904, the mountain gorilla. Mountain gorillas live in the Albertine Rift Mountains, which are cloud forests. These cloud forests have a similar rainfall and temperature to the cloud forests of Vancouver and the surrounding area that the Tlingit called home. So no one can argue that apes cannot live in North America. All in all, whether you want to call it Buffalo Man, Ape Man, or Otter Man, there is a cultural precedent, as well as an ecological precedent, for the existence of these upright creatures all around the world. They can be found in the hard-to-get-to places of the world, and they've been here a long time, and I hope they will be here long after we're gone. I hope this video makes as much sense to you as it does to me. This stuff is kind of difficult to explain. But like the video if you see where I'm coming from, and of course, as always, thanks an awful lot for listening.